sitting as a uh, member of parliament uh, is one of the greatest privileges that any Australian can have. I want to make sure that I can look at upon the time I was there and not think, geez, you know, why didn't I say that? Why did I go quiet on that? I should have spoken up later about that. So, um, uh, you know, so, so I'm more than happy to argue uh, different points uh, and bring up different points. So I think that's a most important part of uh, our democratic process. Yep, the omnibus bill. When someone told me about it, I thought, that can't be right. You, you, you couldn't, they must have misinterpreted or they must have mistaken. It can't be right. You can't, it, it, no, no, no uh, democracy, I think, uh, Western democracy in history has put a law before its parliament that would authorise basically a private militia to go and arrest people. I said, this cannot be right. So I said, I've got to, I'm not going to comment on until I've checked it myself because it just sounds wrong. And then I read, I thought, my God. Is that they've actually brought this into Parliament. I can't believe what I'm reading. You telling me under this law that actually what the Victorian government could do is appoint anyone. It could be a, a union official or it could be the heavies of the CFMEU. Uh, it could be they could go and get, uh, you know, the security contractors, whoever they want, and basically give them power to arrest anyone and not if you've committed it. And that gets, if you think that's, that in itself is bad enough, right? It should be a, a lawful police officer has to arrest you for, if you're committing a crime against the statutes. And we've seen even how bad that is in Victoria at the moment, right? So, but they're going to allow anyone that they deputise to arrest you. And, and, and then it gets, and then um, basically detain you indefinitely. So at least if you get arrested at the moment, even by big term police force, you go down to the police station, you can get bail and you can, you can get out, right? And yeah. then you've got to go before a judge. This would allow them to arrest you and detain you indefinitely without the right of bail, without seeing a judge. Right? Now, and then it gets worse. What they can, you don't even have to commit a crime. They've only got to think that you are thinking about committing a crime. Now, this is even George Orwell, this goes for, further than George Orwell's 1984, at least in you know, his dystopian novel, 1984, you had to actually commit a thought crime. That's where the word thought crime comes from, is where you, you think about you might be committing uh, a, a crime, right? And they would put sensors on your head and you say, yes, you're thinking about committing a crime. Well, in Dan Andrews' case, they don't actually put the sensors on your head. A non-elect, uh, uh, anyone that Andrews appoints to give the power of arrest can think that you're thinking about it, whether you're thinking about it or not. So you may not even be thinking about, you may not even be committing a thought crime. You may not be even thinking that you are going to commit a crime, which, which is whether it's a crime or not, it's another, another issue, whether, it's the, whether those laws are constitutional or another issue. But it's not whether you're actually thinking, it's whether they think that you are thinking about it. Yeah. Now, this is, this is against every single principle that every Australian that has gone to war and fought about. Like we've got 100,000 Australians that gave up their lives to protect and fight against governments doing these things. Every day when I walk into the federal parliament, I look down, you look down across the, the strip there, you look down from parliament, you look over Lake Burley Griffin, you look down Anzac Avenue, and you see the war memorial down there. And that reminds you, 100,000 Australians gave their lives to protect our freedoms, to guarantee our freedoms. And then you see someone trying to bring regulation like this in Parliament. And then what's even worse, there's hardly a mention of this in the media. I looked last night. Well, we give the ABC a billion, $1.3 billion a year. That's $1,300 million. And I can't even see where they'd mentioned this. If this, was, if it was, this was the Chinese Communist government trying to bring in regulation like this into Hong Kong, right? The, a the ABC would be all over it. And they'd be saying, how outrageous it is that the, the Chinese government is, is, is doing these things. And how dare the poor people of Hong Kong now face arbitrary arrest, uh, indefinite intention, not even by the police force, but by people appointed by the Communist Party of China. And there'd be outrage around the world. Amnesty International would be jumping up and down. Our human rights people would be jumping up and down. And yet this is happening in Victoria and there's not people from these people.
Now you have mentioned Victoria Police, but I know that you've been pretty heavy about sharing stuff online about it. So, I mean, if you had just one message um, to say to the Victoria Police, what would you say to them? First, I'd say I have been a, a great support. One of the, my jobs in Parliament is the Chairman of the Law Enforcement Committee. And I have been a strong supporter of the police uh, all the time. Wherever there's been an area of grey, I've always sided on the police side because I know the great difficult uh, job that, that they have. But what I'm seeing in Victoria, I'm sorry, I cannot support that. Um, and what I would say is that there's like a social licence that exists in our society between the, the law enforcement officials and the public. And if the public think that the law enforcement officials are going to treat them with uh, respect uh, and courtesy and you're not, you know, not subject them to arbitrary arrest and uh, you know, uh, apply the benefit of reasonable doubt and where things are, and uh, uh, that respect comes back from the people, and the citizens, to the police force. So it makes the job of being uh, the police Actually, easier if, if you're a police officer and you're walking down the streets and everyone's saying, hey, "Officer, how are you going? Doing your mate? They have things, you know, and look at you with a friendly smile." It makes your job easier. But if you're walking down the street and people look at you and they fear you and, and they step back, that makes your job as a police officer harder. And it, it, and we're so lucky in Australia that we've had that great sort of circular relationship of trust in the police and the police trust in society. Now. There's, there's always been a few problems here and there, but we've seen nothing like they have in America where you've got large numbers of people calling out defund the police. And we don't have what it is like in a lot of South American countries where you're supposed to give the, the police a backhander or a lot of what we saw you know, in, in Eastern Euro European countries when, when the, uh, the war was up. Um, I mean, a lot of these people that have migrated from Eastern Europe would see the police and they would fear the police because they know that they could be arbitrarily arrested and the police wouldn't treat them fairly. Now, we're so lucky in our society that relationship exists. Now, but what we are seeing in Victoria is the breakdown, the destruction of that relationship that has been built up over 100 years in this country. And irrespective of anything else, that will have long-term, uh, serious, uh, irreparable and unintended consequences, which will make our society worse. So look, you know, I would call on the Victorian police and for goodness sake, firstly, think about uh, the optics, the senior is think about the optics of what you are doing. Now, the, now I'm sure there's many people in, in the Victorian police force that are thinking the same thing. They're thinking, hang on a minute, they're going to go and watch this, what? You know, I, I didn't sign up to the police. I didn't join the police force to go and arrest 70-year-old grandmothers. No. I, I didn't join up to the police force to break down people's doors and then to go and arrest pregnant mothers and slap them in handcuffs and have their children so frightened that their kids are hiding under the bed when I'm there. That's not why I joined the, I joined the police force and swore an honour to uphold and protect the law. So I think it's, it, it's not too far away. There's got to be some officers of good conscience. They're going to put uh, you know, the, what they believe in before and, 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 and damn the consequences down the track Stand on your conscience, stand on your principles and say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to support this and go and stand with the protesters during one of these parts. Uh, so I have 22,000 members and a lot of them are finding it hard to stay positive. I'm doing my best to give yes. them actions to give, make them feel purposeful and uh, part of the solution. But um, if you had one message that you could give my members to perhaps, look, it's okay to be scared. That's a, that's a good fe a fear, yes, yeah. a good motivator. But can you give us some direction on what we could do to help? Uh, and also just some hope, if you can think of any, that would be really okay. helpful. Firstly, what I do is say to anyone that's going through a tough time, hang in there because you get to vote. The writing is on the wall for that man. You've got to look forward to is when he is absolutely humiliated uh, before the public. Forget all this, the polls and everyone supports him and all that. That's, that's complete. That's complete rubbish, right? Yeah. So hang in there and remember uh, the enjoyment that you will get on the day that he is forced to eat hum humble pie and is left with egg all over his face because of the catastrophic mistakes that he's done. So that's, that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say, um, get involved uh, in, in, in politics. Um, you know, take an interest in it. Uh, join, uh, you know, I'm not saying join, join a political party. It doesn't matter whether it's 
the party I represent, or the, or the National Party, or even the Greens, or the or the or the, or the, or the party, join one of those political parties, because you find that these political parties are, are controlled by a very small number uh, of, of people, uh, and the more people that get involved in politics, the more people that join at the grassroots root, the greater opportunity you've got to participate and, and have, have your say. I think that's also a very, very important point. The other thing I think that, that if you're looking for something positive to come out of this, I think people will understand um, how precious our freedoms are. Right? You know, you've got, um, we, I, my life, I've been, I, you know, I'm never going to have to go and, uh, you know, be conscripted and going to have to fight in a war and put a, a rifle over my shoulder and, uh, you know, carry a bayonet and going to have to fight. On. That's something my generation has, has been spared from, you know, and, and we take our, our peace, we take our freedom of speech and our rights, you know, we, get, we become a, a bit blasé about them as though they, they, they just exist, you know. We, you know, remember that if you look throughout all human history, the freedoms of speech and the rights that we have in the democratic processes only ever existed to a very small wafer thin uh, you know, people throughout history. And that's us here today. And we've only had them because of, you know, the sacrifices uh, you know, in blood, sweat and tears and death that our previous generations have fought for. And uh, uh, freedom of speech is, it's, our society is, is, is very, very, very fragile. These democratic processes and these freedoms that, that, that we have, uh, that we enjoy. And we should never, ever take them for, for, for granted. We've got to fight for them. Uh, you know, we've got to protect them uh, because they, they haven't come for free in the past and we just can't take them for granted like we have. You know, this is a great wake-up call, uh, I think, to everyone that we've got to stand up and we've got to fight for freedom of speech. We've got to fight for our liberties because otherwise they can be whittled away very, very quickly. But what I just say to, to everyone down there in Victoria uh, are suffering, um, uh, people around the country know how tough you, you're doing it. Uh, you know, we're seeing a maniac that's 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 taken control of the things, and, and without any thought of the, the consequences of the pain uh, and suffering uh, that's being caused to many people in small independent businesses. And uh, you know, um, look, I know up here in, in New South Wales, uh, you know, we feel your pain. We we, we hear you calling out. Um, you know, we're doing as much as we can on the, the political side to put pressure on this. Uh, this can't go on forever. Uh, it won't. And as I said, just remember. Hang in there, right? Because in the future, you're going to see this man, Dan Andrews, with egg all over his face and you have to eat humble pie. You know, and that's something you've got, you've got to look forward to. You certainly don't want to miss out on that.